why are people worried? Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on the toxicology, but the, the basic worry is something that the toxicologists call translocation. Um, it's important to realize that when, when you're down at that scale, you're designing things at a biological scale. So a red blood cell is 7,000 nanometers in diameter. A strand of DNA is about two nanometers across. So you're basically creating things that can act very, very intimately with the body. And that, in some cases, is good news. I mean, that's why the medical profession is very, very excited about this. But it also has a lot of people worried in terms of the ability of, of these particles to go places in the body that other particles simply could not go. So there's worry about sunscreens and whether there's dermal penetration. Uh, there's some studies that have occurred, at least in animals, where the particles have gone into the olfactory lobe and into the brain. Uh, that's actually got a lot of people excited who want to deliver drugs to the brain uh, because this might be a way of getting drugs basically into the brain in a fairly non-invasive way and a very targeted way. Um, just to give you an idea, this over here, right up, right up there is the air exchange membrane in your lung. Um, that's 1,000 nanometers across. That's one of the thinnest tissues in the human body. One other thing, obviously, that, that has people worried is, is, you know, is this going to be look anything like asbestos? And certainly you can create particles that will mimic asbestos. Um, these are just three forms of zinc oxide out of about 24 forms that have been created at Georgia Tech. Same chemical, okay, 24 different structural forms. So one can imagine that each one of these structural forms may have very different properties once it's in the body. So there's some real issues about, you know, exactly the way these things look structurally can have huge impacts uh, on, on the environment, on human health. And obviously, if I can produce 100 different structural variations of one chemical, that gives people a lot to think about and a lot to study. Some of the other things that are worry people about, there's been some research on increased inflammatory response, uh, immune suppression. And then there's the issue of will certain people be more susceptible? People have identified a gene, for instance, in the body that if you have this particular gene, uh, you're far more susceptible to beryllium exposure. And your chance of getting lung cancer is 20 times greater than somebody without this gene. Now, luckily, not many people are exposed to beryllium. But as we learn more about the genetic makeup of human beings, uh, the questions will become apparent. Are there certain subpopulations that might be more susceptible? And this raises issues around, obviously, environmental justice, who's exposed, who's not. Uh, the other thing I would say, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, is the systems for protecting us are fairly weak. Uh, there's deficiencies in the regulations. Uh, there's large gaps in the regulatory authority of the government agencies designed to protect you. A lot of, of essentially lack of resources. Uh, quite often the laws might work, but there's nobody really to implement them. And then the whole issue of just, this is moving very quickly. As I say, we've seen a doubling of products in less than 14 months. Can, can the government keep up with this? This is some work we've done with UMass Lowell. Um, this was an, a direct quote from a safety manager in a firm here in Massachusetts. Uh, we don't really understand what regulatory requirements might be applicable to nanotech. A lot of the regulations were not designed when nanotech even existed. Uh, they were designed 30, 40, 50, in some cases 100 years ago. And we're trying to apply them, obviously, to a very new technology. There's people that think that we need some more regulation. This was a piece in the New York Times uh, sort of bemoaning the lack of regulatory clarity around biotech. And uh, it's actually having an impact on the willingness of people to invest in biotech. Here's the Food and Drug Administration. The Food and Drug Administration regulates 25% of the US GDP. So they're the gorilla on the block in terms of who regulates what starting with all cosmetics, whole foods, supplements, food ingredients, additives, food packaging, and then obviously what they're known most for are drugs and biomedical devices. Uh, they have both tools they can use before stuff comes into the market, pre-market, and after it comes in if it's causing problems. The black areas are areas where they have virtually no authority. Now the interesting thing is the areas they have no authority are also the areas where most nano products are appearing right now in areas of cosmetics and dietary supplements. Less of a problem around drugs and biomedical devices. There's about 15 drugs on, and biomedical devices on the market right now. 
uh, that are nano-engineered. There's hundreds more in the clinical pipeline. So these, you'll begin to see these kind of trickle out over the next few years. This is the one that people forget about. There's a huge argument, well, will the regulations work? Won't they work? Um, it doesn't really matter if you don't have the resources to do anything. If you can't enforce, you can't inspect, you don't have the resources or the expertise to test this stuff. So let me just show you what's going on with the agencies. The EPA's budget today is less than the EPA's budget was in 1973. They don't have a lot of money. And of course, their mandate is exploded. Food and Drug Administration, FDA's budget is around 50% what it had in 1996. So these agencies have been systematically cut back. Consumer Product Safety Commission, one of the sleeper agencies, is in a little nondescript building in Bethesda, Maryland. They oversee 15,000 products, product lines, with 400 people. When they were, when they were started, they, there was about 1,000 people. They're down to 400. They only have one person to test toys, one person. Okay. So I want you to think a little bit about the last seven months. And on October 4th, the, CPC, the CPSC recalled a half a million toys in the U.S. for violating the lead paint standard. We thought we'd essentially gotten lead out of our environment. All of those toys were made in China. You go back a few more months, we had rat poison and pet food, again from China. And we had diethylene glycol, which is a, essentially an antifreeze additive, appear in our toothpaste. Again, that's the FDA, not CPSC. So we, we, we were in a situation where we're unable really to deal with some of the most basic toxins. The pernicious effects of lead have been known since 2000 BC, and yet they're coming into the marketplace. The important thing to remember here is an awful lot of the nanoproducts are being made in China, increasingly, Pacific Rim, China, Korea, and they will come across our borders. OSHA, these are the people that end up in the workplace to protect workers, again, eviscerated over the past 10 years or so. Um, the, the thing is, you don't really have to change laws to limit oversight, you just cut budgets. And I can do this at a federal level, I can do it at a state level, I can do it at a local level. And these are the people that essentially are out there supposedly protecting us.